Rutgers University, author of They Came Before Columbus, Journal of African Civilization, Blacks in Science, and also, what is the latest one? What is your latest book? Black, um, Women, Egypt Revisited. Egypt Revisited, which, was, which should be out sometime very shortly. All right, this time I want everyone to give a warm African welcome to Dr. Ivan Van Sertima. My subject today is Egyptian science. It takes, in fact, a great deal of courage to attempt such a subject, because Egypt, unlike any other civilization, ranged over three millennia. And its science begins very early indeed. Our science today, modern science, the efflorescence of modern science, the flowering of modern science, the high point of modern science only ranges over about a century. Several developments have been going on for a few centuries, but the things that we are seeing now moving with great speed, every day now there is a new invention. The Egyptians had a tremendous advantage. And in over 3,000 years, so many things have happened that it is quite impossible, partly through the lack of records, but partly through the fact that we have, even when we find records, we are overwhelmed by the data, and some of it has not yet been interpreted. The Egyptians had the most remarkable science of ancient times. Now, one could not begin a discussion of Egyptian technology or Egyptian science without first pointing out who are the Egyptians. I think in this church it is taken already for granted that the original Egyptians were black, and that is largely the case. There is no question now about it. Not only was Egypt, original Egypt, largely black, dominantly black, but it was culturally African, it was technologically African, its religion was African, its language was African. The discovery at Kustal in Nubia and at Hierakampolis of elements that were later to flower in Egypt, these are found south of Egypt, where there has been no question of the black base. You have found these empires, particularly at Kustal, at Kustal in Nubia, where Bruce Williams discovered, Seal and Williams discovered this enormous royal cemetery of 33 tombs. And in these tombs, they found hundreds of shattered pots and stoneware vessels, and they brought them back to the United States. They were patched together, you could tell from the microscopic cracks how they could be fitted together. And there, then they found, having fitted it together laboriously over quite a number of years, that the falcon god Horus, the chief god of the Egyptians, originated in the Sudan even before it moved up into Egypt. They find a dozen black kings reigned in the Nile Valley even before, even before Scorpion and Narma, the first of the great Egyptian kings. They find that the hieroglyphs, the world's first major writing system, which was to affect other writing systems in the world, other major writing systems, that is also found written by the black kings and the blacks that are found south of the Egyptian world at least two centuries before the Egyptian dynasty. There also you find the Sereks, the palace facades, 
all the elements, all the political and religious elements that have become associated with Egyptian central organization, Egyptian philosophy, Egyptian religion, all the things that decorate the kings, all the things that have become part of the royal paraphernalia, all of these things are found first among the blacks in the Sudan. As they move up into Egypt, there comes the question, but are these Egyptians black? And the reason why this is brought in question is two reasons. There are two reasons. The one is the obvious one, prejudice. The obvious one is easy to deal with because there you have, when Egypt was rediscovered by Europeans, when the Greeks saw it at first thousands of years ago, they knew that the people were black. They made it quite clear that these were not only black-skinned people, but woolly-haired, because people have contended that you have dark Europeans, like Italians, etc., in southern Europe, etc., and a dark skin does not make you black. And that the English, for example, have a habit of calling anybody darker than them black. They call the Spanish black. Okay, this was used at the conference and until Diop pointed out, but what about the hair? You know, that, that is something you can't argue with. And Herodotus said they were not only black skinned but woolly hair. So those of you who've read or heard about that conference remember the absurd Abdullah who jumped up when Diop showed that even the melanin content in the mummies, when he scraped the mummies, and by the way, Diop discovered, and it comes out in a very interesting interview with Dr. Finch he had in Senegal this summer, that Diop discovered that people had been scraping the mummies before and they knew. They knew. They never said a word. They kept what they discovered quiet. And when he scraped skin off and he put it in the laboratories, he found that the melanin content in the skin clearly established they were an African race, that you did not find that melanin dosage in the European. And when he begged them to give him just a little square millimeter so that he could study more closely, or if you, a square inch or so of other mummies, they would not let him have it. But, when Diop established the blackness of the Egyptians, Abdullah jumped up and said, even if they're black skinned, they are white. <laughs> yes. And it was very important to the European to think so because he, in his arrogance, had conquered most of the known world. In his arrogance, he had shattered all before him. In his arrogance, he had destroyed other civilizations. Now, the, the Africans invaded Europe too, at least three times, but they never destroyed European civilization. They enriched it. This is the great tragedy. Whenever Europe advanced, she stamped her foot on what she found. The arrogance that led to that contempt that my way is the only way so that those people who call themselves Christians call themselves Christians, mind you, in the name of our brother, the Christ, they actually, Europeanizing the Christ, used him in his name to enslave us. So that to this day, people are very confused, blaming on Christianity what has nothing to do with the essential Christ but had to do with the European conception of Christianity or their practice of Christianity, which was to make a mockery of the whole thing. So that the life of man, great dichotomies occurred in Europe, so that the sensual life of man, the magic, the joy, the sheer joy of being human, of being alive, became mocked in the Spanish Inquisition where it was forbidden to laugh. That is the absurdity to which a younger people, immature, arrogant because of their insecurities, was to bring the Christian religion. They even crucified their scientists, Galileo and all of these people, who suffered because they had the courage to make 
statements that were not in agreement with the church. The church even banned the, the study of advanced mathematics as late as the 17th century. It was a capital offense to study advanced mathematics in Europe. Why? Because the Arabs and Africans were doing it. The study Arabic manuscripts in this language of science was in Arabic at that time. And Arabic, by the way, doesn't belong to the Saudi Arabians. When one talks of Arabic, one is now talking outside of just one race. Arabs are not a race. Okay, you have black Arabs, you have white Arabs. People speaking Arab are Arabs. That is how it was carried. And when the Arabs moved into Africa, they became Africa. And when that first attack was made on Europe by the Muslims, it included a vast number of Africans. And Africans were to come out of Africa and continue those movements. But what did the Africans bring to Europe? They did not bring destruction. Obviously, people were killed. All battles end in the killing of people. So Africans killed Europeans too. But they did not enslave them. They did not destroy their cultures, they enriched them. The Moorish thing, the first paved streets in Europe, the first library in Europe were brought by the Africans and Arabs in the Muslim invasion. They brought light, not darkness. They brought a different kind of gentleness to invasion. It did not have the rapacity, the aggression, the murder, the sense that one had to kill in order to be, it was not necessary. This was very alien to the spirit of those invasions. When Hannibal entered Europe too, he spent there 10 years. You cannot see any shattered European statues. Wherever the European is marched, he smashed our noses or blown like the Sphinx. Just to Two years ago, I was on the telephone in a link-up with Sheikh Anta Diop and Gamel Mokhtar, the Egyptian, at UNESCO in Paris, and we had Egyptian and French translators. And God were we discussing the fact that in the back room of the British Museum are the splinters of the Sphinx note. And we're trying to get the Egyptians to reclaim it. And why did that happen? Why did the nose always offend them? Because it was the one feature that made us look different from them. When they walked into Egypt, the Napoleonic armies and all their arrogance saw not the humbled African that they had reduced into slaves. They saw a godlike African, the Sphinx, the greatest figure still, the largest figure of a carving sculpture of a human being. They saw a broad-browed, broad nose, broad-cheeked, broad lip, broad chin, God staring down at them with contempt. And they blew off its nose, or they tried to. This was the beginning of an attack on anything that reminded them that the African had once stood on the highest rung of civilization. It was very important to make the slave and later the colonial and the second class citizen in the Americas and throughout the world, the African included, to make him believe that he was an inferior. That the reason why he had not made it as they did the reason why they had the power and the influence and everything was because it was ordained, because they were biological inferiors, because they were cursed, because they did not have the genes, the brains, in order to be as good as the European. Therefore, to reveal a history that showed that this was just the opposite, that they had built great cities, that they had been involved in technology, not only involved, but they had built the ground floor upon which others were to build. That European metaphysics, European philosophical doctrines, 
European scientific concepts, European machines fed upon inventions. They fed upon the genius of that world, the back of that world. So it wasn't simply muscle. It wasn't simply muscle of the African world that helped to build Europe. It was also the genius. No invasion has ever led so much to the counter invasion as the Greek on the Egyptian. Because although the Greeks physically invaded Egypt, Egypt spiritually invaded Greece. Because when the Greeks attacked the Africans, they then began to be profoundly affected and changed by the essence of African thinking. Thus it is that every major Greek Thales of Miletus, Democritus, Pythagoras, Eudocius marched into Egypt and sat at the foot of Egyptian teachers and learned their doctrines, learned their science. Pythagoras did not initiate the Pythagorean theorem. He merely announced it. All of these people were profoundly affected. Aristotle, all, there's a whole range of them. GGM James mentions them in his book. Those people who were profoundly affected. I'm going to touch on various aspects, but let me say something about the GGM James book. And this must stand as a warning about other people who are trying to establish parallels or influences of the African on the European or the Asiatic, etc. Please be very careful not to point to simple things which could be done by any people anywhere in the world. James, for example, and that's a brilliant classic, but he has, it has weaknesses, and many blacks follow this quite blindly and casually. For example, he mentions the doctrine of the existence of God among the Egyptians which passed over among the Greeks. That is absolute nonsense. Anyone can think of God. Rightly or wrongly, it occurs automatically. You're living in a universe where you're aware of the billions of stars spinning around you, the strange motion of the heavens, the extraordinary mystery of life itself. That could occur even to an ape. That had nothing to do with the Egyptians passing anything on to the Greeks. You have to be very specific when you're talking about influences because people blame us to say, look, you're claiming the blacks began everything and that we are not even people. No one is saying that people are people are people. Man was born in Africa. The first man is therefore an African. There's no question about that. All men, therefore, be whatever their race, have African ancestors somewhere down the line. But that is at a very early stage. We are saying we go beyond that. We're not talking simply about man being born in Africa, but that doesn't prove anything because the European says, look what a mess you made of it. You were born first and you were now last. So it's not an argument necessarily in one's favor. One has to go beyond that. And the evidence points beyond that, that, not man, that it wasn't merely a question of man being born in Africa, but the first civilizations were in Africa. The first high cultures were in Africa. The first sciences, advanced sciences were in Africa. And one has to trace in what precise way they were taken out of that African world and in what precise way did they affect the rest of the world. Because the European likes to claim everything. He has claimed everything. And some of the slides you will see today will startle you. I will speak for some time before I come to those slides so as not to cause disruption. But let me touch on a number of things. Agriculture. This was supposed to be the beginnings of high civilizations because many people, Europeans and Africans, Asians, were running about 
hunting for animals, etc. They were in a sort of nomadic state. And then came settlement. Agriculture brought this. In some cases, some people were so poor off that they merely scratched the soil and remained at that level. But in, along the great rivers, particularly the Nile Valley, the Africans built up an incredible civilization. They were the first people in agriculture. Just two years ago, and this comes out in the book Blacks and Science, which by the way is on sale here, in Blacks and Science, you have an essay by Wendor Children Close, a team that went out and discovered that at Wadi Kubania in ancient Egypt, 18,000 years ago, at Wadi Kubania and at Wadi Tushka and Nubia in the Sudan, Blacks were cultivating crops scientifically. They had entered the area of crop science. That was not thought to have come to the world until 7,000 years later. In other words, all other civilizations, be they European, Asiatic, or Asiatic, America was not, oh yes, they were Americans because they had crossed the Bering Straits by then. All civilizations, be they African, Asiatic, or American, were not yet at that stage. Africans had entered what is known as the Neolithic phase, the phase of agriculture. They found a mortar and pestle 18,000 years old, the first mortar and pestle in the world for grinding corn, for grinding corn is found in Nubia and in Egypt. Their medicine startles us, the quality of their medicine. You will see a picture of Imhotep. And when you see his picture, you would have to be blind, more than color blind. You would have to be truly blind <laughs> to question whether he's an African or not. And he comes straight out of that great third dynasty where the first enormous pyramid was built. He was known as Imhotep. Imhotep. He was known as Imhotep among the Greeks. He was worshipped. And in fact, you will see Asclepius, the European, holding an African stick. He's the god of healing among the Greeks. And he's holding an African stick with the African snake crawling up the stick. There, that is not Greek at all. That is not Greek at all. Even in, when I was in East Africa, I was grant, given a stick with the snake by Chief Inhema the second as a gift. I came to New York and I fell asleep on the bus. That was my first experience of New York. I never saw it again. I like to think it went back to Africa. <laughs> but their medical papyri, it is not true that we have no books. Fortunately for us, apart from the fact that there still are papyri, that is books, because books were not made in squares as they are made today. That happened after the 15th century. They were rolled up papyri, often laboriously written out, etc., all over the world. But apart from the medical papyri that exists, apart from the books that, the texts that still exist, the good thing about Africans is that they wrote everywhere. Those of you who've been to Egypt will note that Africans wrote everywhere, and they didn't do it like how they do it in the New York subway. <laughs> they wrote intelligently, but they wrote everywhere. There are at least 10 medical texts that survive, and the two most important are the Ebers Papyrus and Edwin Smith Papyrus. And the these papyri are quite astonishing considering their age. The Ebers papyrus, for example, which is 1,500 years before Christ, that is about 3,500 years ago, written by Africans 3,500 years ago, has chapters on intestinal disease, helminthiasis, ophthalmology, dermatology, gynecology, obstetrics, pregnancy, diagnosis, contraception, dentistry, 
surgical treatments of abscesses, tumors, fractures, and burns, chapters on movement of the heart, the pulse, diagnostic percussion. We are supposed to be the witch doctors. <laughs> Gagliungi, commenting on this, says, in fact, the papyrus, and he speaks uh, now about the Edmund Smith papyrus, which occurs earlier, and which is not as complex as the Ebers papyrus, which occurs 1500 BC. The Edmund Smith papyrus, which occurs 2600 BC, which is about 5,000 years ago, he says of it, this papyrus proved the existence of an objective and scientific medicine devoid of theories and magic except in one case and based on the attentive and repeated observation of the patient on bedside experience and on a hitherto unsuspected knowledge of anatomy. So even in that very early stage, you find quite unusual ki kind of medicine occurring. Uh, Dr. Finch, uh, Dr. Newsom had written about early doctors, and Dr. Finch takes it further. Let me say something about what emerges from the Newsom essay, which you will see in Blacks and Science, where he speaks of the fact that Imhotep is the true father of medicine. He emerges as a multi-genius, an architect, an engineer, a doctor, etc. But there are one or two people before him. There is a woman a chief physician called Preshet. There is, um, uh, there is the first, what he believes to be the first, what is uh, suggested to be the first, a man called Athotis, who wrote books on anatomy. He was the son of Minis, the first great pharaoh. But we have not found the books. They have not found the books. But this Imhotep was an extraordinary man. He lived around 2980 BC, during the reign of Zosa of the Third Dynasty. And he was the first man to take the pyramid to the heights. He was the first to make the, these enormous things out of hewn stone. And he built this incredible step pyramid. He, was a, he became worshipped as a deity by both Africans and Europeans. And in fact, later on, he was not only identified with Asclepius, the European god of healing, but then he was later identified with Christ, even though he was clearly very black. It's very strange how Christ, a brother, and I'm not commenting because we do not know what kind of mixtures he had. In American terms, he would be called black. But it's very strange how that brother was given golden hair and blue eyes, and eventually became not the gentle father that could have saved us, but almost was turned into a figure that could mock us, so that I remembered as a boy crying when a friend of mine, I was a young man then, I was about 20, and I, 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 even then, even though I believed in European superiority because we were trained to believe in that, and we were trained, at that time I had never read anything about Africans except Tarzan. <laughs> and this boy turned to me and he said, you know, why are we fighting, you know, the, the, we could never beat the white man, even Christ is white, even God is white. And I mean, I mean, I cried. I couldn't, I mean, because I couldn't question that at the time. That God must have known the white man was superior, that he chose to appear in a white form. This is how we thought of it. And this is, therefore, they did it with great deliberateness. They knew they had to make him white. Everything had to be made European. So that the man they conquered could no longer have calms and doubts. He could feel, look, why should I question these people? Truly they are superior. Not only are they more powerful and wealthy than I am, but even God chose them. They are the chosen people. God chose them because even his prophets are white. 
Even the man he sent as a messenger is white. How could he be white? Even the Messiah comes from Mesu, Egyptian, the anointed. And he, in, 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 in Matthew chapter 2, verse 15, he says, out of Egypt I have called my son. That could be translated two ways, either that he was originally Egyptian, which I don't think he was, but he was sent to Egypt when Herod started the tremendous persecution. Christ was smuggled into Egypt, and Christ grew up in Egypt. And when he said, out of Egypt, I have called my son, he was calling him back for the mission. But he was educated in Egypt. His, uh, his childhood was in Egypt. He lived in the village of Marathia, near Hierakompolis. Therefore, he's profoundly affected by Egyptian teachings. He was to give a personal lightning and particularity to his preaching so that you can't just say, oh, because he... <coughs> There is Essenism in his teaching that he's an Essene because Christ, because of his extraordinary personal lightning and magic, was able to invest a special quality to what he taught. Those men are beyond race because Muhammad was no Arab. Muhammad was nearly killed by the Arabs. He was an Arab in race or if Arab is a race, Arab is not a race, but he was among the Saudi Arabians. He grew up, he, that was part of his flesh and blood, but he fought against everything that was Arab, just like Christ. Christ fought against everything that was Jewish, although he was a Jew. And when I say everything that was Jewish, I mean everything that was, that had distorted, everything that was Jewish that was tribal, and clannish and materialistic. He fought against those values. That is why the high priest wanted to turn him over to the Romans and kill him. The Romans didn't think he was important, just a little barefoot carpenter who had made a bit of a noise somewhere, healing people and making a lot, working wonders. They wondered why the fuss but the Jews were out to get him because he was not behaving the way they wanted him to behave. He went into the church and raced them out. He had no stupid idea that because this is a church, you could make it into anything you please. The how This was the house of God for him. Therefore, what was holy was the truth. Is not putting on nice clothes and making nice noises and swinging incense through the church makes you holy. I think it is important that we should reinterpret Christ the brother because many people have turned away from Christianity on the assumption that it is European. The reason why the Europeans found it so difficult to be Christians is because true Christianity was alien to what was happening in Europe. That is why, that is why Hitler eventually emerged the Antichrist. It was in opposition to all the, all the values that Christ presented. Christ upturned, Christ upturned the Roman ideas about what was right and what was wrong. The Europeans, for example, felt this arrogance, this pride was very important. Christ said, no, it is the humble man, it is the meek who shall inherit the earth. They felt their great wealth would make them rise to the top of, of the heap. Christ said, no, the rich man, it is as hard for the rich man to enter my heaven as it is for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle. He turned everything upside down so that he challenged the values. That is why he became a candidate for assassination because he was a rebel. He was not the kind of thing that they lock up now in the church and where the Pope could start, stand above the vast horror and poverty of the world and make a lot of simple platitudinous statements and think that he's close to God. 
Some of the things that those popes have done if Christ was, was alive, he would have whipped them. But let me leave that alone for a while. Let me come back to Egypt, yet I am in Egypt because this has to do with Egypt. It is not just science because in those days, the concept of the universe, the concept of man, the purity of the individual, the power within man had to do with science. Religion and science, therefore, in that pure and absolute sense, were connected and inseparable. That is why it is so hard to separate these things when one comes back to the primal source. One begins to see why these things are not separable but integrated. But to come back to their medicine, Dr. Finch points out in his essay that they may have had some form of a socialized medicine. This is extremely interesting because their medical services were open all the doctors were paid by the state and you find that they had an advanced no and detailed knowledge of neuroanatomy the structure and function of the cardiovascular system unsurpassed skills in bandaging which we know nobody could bandage even today like the Egyptians when they bandage you are properly bandaged <laughs> You're banished for thousands of years. Because Princess Meany, in 1963, at the University of Oklahoma, they took cells out of her hand and found that they were so well preserved that at just one other step, they could have been put in a solution and transplanted. It, it was, they had reached that extraordinary stage of development. The chemistry of mummification is quite extraordinary. They also had specialist skills. They were the first people to introduce high specialization in medicine. They had a doctor for every organ. And they did this as early as the Old Kingdom, many, many thousands of years ago. Then they moved towards a more generalized medicine and then they turn back to specialization, as Dr. Finch points out, in the Ptolemaic period. When we come to deal with pyramids, and that is a long story, but let me point to a few things about the pyramids. Today I will show you an unusual method by which the Egyptians were able to illuminate the tunnels and chambers on the ground that they built certain connections, certain shafts that link up with certain stars and they had metal reflectors and when the star shone in the metal reflector it would be reflected up on the wall, hit another reflector and this would go right through their tunnels and chambers. So they had a light source from the sun, not the candle because they were always astonished how come could the Egyptians draw these marvelous paintings far on the ground in chambers that normally would be too dark. And if you lit a candle, the candle would have left smudges on the wall. There was no evidence of the candle grease or the candle smoke in those paintings. And they wondered how come they found the smokeless light source. But they were already making use of the sun through reflection. They were running it through the light of the sun. They were running it through the ground in all of those complex uh, mazes and chambers. One will also point to the method they use to move the great stones, the ramps, the levers building up to one story, the scaling ladders which they didn't think they have. They're scaling ladders with wheels. There are evidence of their ramps and levers. There are evidence of them moving. There's one stone they left in a quarry which was 1,618 1, tons, the largest stone ever moved successfully here in the Americas is 217 tons at Tihotihuacan. And the astonishing thing is that the Americans were found to be moving the stones 
which they hadn't moved before, when they started to move heavy stones, they were using the identical method of the Egyptians. And what is also strange too, that the Americans had developed at, in Peru, you will see at Saxa Farman, you will see what is known as fitted megalithic masonry, where you have enormous blocks of stone, sometimes with ten sides. Everything here has four sides in this room, almost. That's the standard method of building. Everything is standard in squares. But in Egypt and in parts of ancient South America, you will find blocks which have many sides, not four. And you want to know how on earth could they know how to fit block with eight sides onto block another block. And they could do it without mortar, and you can't put a pier in between those blocks. And now they have, when they were among the Incas, the Spaniards, the Incas told them that their ancestors had discovered a method, the juice of certain red leaves that could soften stone. And said, you know, that is impossible. But recently scientists have discovered, and let me quote it because it's an extraordinary name, scientists have discovered something called um, polyhydroxy, Polycarbohyd polycarbohydrate. I can't see it without my glasses, but it, it comes out of certain plants and it has the effect of softening the stone. So that the, these people had come upon a science of, of, of linking these things together, of softening the stone, of being able to weather it and so that they could work it easily something that we don't know how to do now. There were various areas they had entered in science. The movement of those stones still mystifies because although we've seen them, there are enormous barges in which they're moving incredible things, things that broke the modern cranes. When, when the Aswan Dam was being built and all the teams rushed down, the archaeological teams rushed down to try and save some of the things in Africa, they found they couldn't move them. They could not move them. The Americans, the nuclear agency in America, went and studied how the, Ameri how the Egyptians used, moved an enormous statue across the desert. And they built up the same kind of rollers and, and ramps, etc., and moved it because they discovered, in spite of all their sophisticated technology, that was the best method of moving it on the desert sand. They moved a nuclear reactor on the desert sand using Egyptian method just a few years ago in Gary. The, you will see a picture where the Egyptians have some peculiar oil. We don't know what it is, but when they throw it on the ground, it allows enormous objects to move as if they're sliding across the ice. You will see pictures of that with all of these men and they're moving these logs and as fast as, as the statues moved across one, they move, they fit it another, they fit another, etc. These guys were able to lift 50 ton stones and put them on the top of skyscrapers without being a fraction of an inch off. The Great Pyramid, the Great Pyramid is half the height of the Empire State Building, and yet it takes up 12 blocks of Manhattan, 13.1 acres. And in spite of its enormous size, so great a size, in fact, that it is pointed out that if you broke the stone into one-foot cubes, it would circle two-thirds of this planet, the materials in that single great pyramid. The one-foot cubes would circle two-thirds of this planet. It is so large that it could hold Westminster Abbey, St. Paul's Cathedral, the major European cathedrals of Florence, Milan, St. Peter's Basilica of Rome. There would still be room for more. It yet, it is done with enormous precision. The right angles at each corner of the base 
line up the walls perfectly with the four cardinal points. It's accurate within 0.07%. The north base is 755.44. The south base, 755.88. East base is 755.77. The west incredible mathematical problem to make it so perfect that when it comes to that point, the sides are perfectly aligned. It takes great mathematics to do that. And because the kind of mathematics, the kind of engineering skill, the kind of architectural genius that it calls for seem to be beyond that of ancient people. All sorts of theories have been advanced recently about spacemen coming down to build the pyramids, etc. What on earth are they going to do with that? And some people s seem to think that that's a marvelous theory, etc. And von Dannigan and people like him do not take into account the slow, careful evolution of mathematics among the Egyptians, the Egyptians, the Africans did not just jump like that. They have an evolution of mathematics. You can see their mathematics slowly developed over the centuries. You could see the pyramid developing. You could see the mastaba. You could see the, them introducing new rooms on the ground. You could see them building pyramids that have as much underneath as above. They much they have as much, the, they have certain pyramids that have as much ground excavated underneath as above. And you see that a slow process until the genius in Hotep takes it a step further. And then after step pyramids, they start to build a true pyramid with steps as a superstructure. I want to point that out because one of the things that have been used against me when I was attacked in the New York Times, they said, I cannot distinguish step pyramids from true pyramids. That was a quote from the man who attacked me, the Walt Disney professor of Cambridge, Glyn Daniels. A man whose only claim to fame is having written some detective short stories in the manner of Ellery Queen. Never went to Africa. Never did any archaeology in pre pre-Columbian America, knows nothing about the subject. He happens to be white. He happens to be a Cambridge professor. He's the head. He, he, he edits a magazine which he never sees. <laughs> He's the general editor. General in a very general sense indeed. Because he doesn't even know what is in his own magazine. Because if he had read his own magazine which he edits, he would have seen the contradiction to his argument about certain things. This is the kind of thing that we face again and again. And I warn you, do not make idle claims. You must always have backup. You must always be very specific because the Egyptians, even when they started to build a true pyramid, which is like that, which has no steps, when you x-ray the pyramid, you find the steps inside. They actually built the steps first and then filled them up to build the cone. So they never lost conception of the steps. And even in the Nubian period, the 25th dynasty, when they started to build pyramids again, which they hadn't done for two centuries before, or they hadn't done for a long time, since 1600 BC, they hadn't done pyramid building. They started it again around 800 BC and they built miniature step and true pyramids. They couldn't build the great pyramids that they had built in earlier times. Why? Because in the early time when the Africans were building those extraordinary monuments, they were at peace. They had conquered all around them. They were, had no threat from the invaders. The European was sitting quietly chewing his cud in Europe. <laughs> but in the 25th dynasty, they couldn't do that. There was war. The sound of war all over. The Syrians were attacking. They captured the Jews. The blacks saved the Jews in 701 BC. And the blacks appeared in Jerusalem. And the Syrians were crushed 
on the Tahaka, who had not yet been king. Hezekiah, the king of the Jews, was wondering where he should surrender to the Syrians until, as the Bible says in Kings, you know, and then they heard say of Tahaka, Behold, I have come out to fight against thee. And then the Syrians were defeated and the Jews were saved. The, because at that time, and bear that in mind, there was a very close association because many of the Jews were blacks anyway. They were brothers. It is only within recent times that most of the Jews have become Europeans. The Jew is not a race. Bear that in mind. There are black Jews and there are white Jews. And there are different changing political situations that have caused the extraordinary situation that we find today. I don't want to comment on that. But to come to other aspects that are very important, the machines, they had machines like the market. And I have a picture here. I've been looking at the book, The Lost Discoveries, and discovering to myself the reason why they're lost. Because they're in the wrong book. This guy is taking things that are Egyptian and putting Caucasoid faces on the discoverers. You see the Marquette, and they're right in the heart of Egypt on the black African sun. Okay. All right, let me change that phrase. On an African sun. <laughs> they're under the African sun, and they're with this machine, test doing with the plumb line, etc., uh, marking off the north south, um, establishing this north south line. And the Caucasoid faces totally, all they have is a tan skin. They, they have, they have, don't have, and there's nothing African about them. All of his discoveries have Caucasoid faces. He go, there is a, a machine, there's a man called Hero or Heron in the Alexandrian world. When, even in the Alexandrian world, African genius and technology still predominated. Even in the Alexandrian war when the Greeks had come in, the reason why they had built Alexandria in Africa was because it was close to African science and genius. Why didn't they go back to Europe and build it there? Those were the people who were teaching at the time, and he takes Heron and makes him into European. Heron invented a model temple when you go to the altar, and you turn on the, look, look at the time, you know, 300 years before Christ. When the priest goes to the altar and he lights a fire, the doors open and the congregation comes in. When the service is coming to an end, the fire starts to go down, the doors begin to close, you leave. And when the fire outs, the doors close automatically. Now you can imagine what it is to do something like that. Then he invented the pneumatic organ, which you will see, all these things I'm talking about, you will see in the slides. He also invented the first steam engine. And do you know what was the principle of power for that steam engine? Jet propulsion. Jet propulsion. And they're calling this Greek, the Alexandrian period Greek, that this is a Greek. There is no, that is no, nothing Greek about Heron or Hero. And you look at their obelisks. Those were not just monuments like that. The obelisk had shadows. It threw shadows on the ground at certain times of the day. And you could mark it off. I have seen a shadow clock in Belgium. You could tell the day with it up to five minutes. And this is long before Christ, you know. These tremendous objects. And you could see from the shadow. You could measure it. And then you could start cutting into minutes, etc. You could cut it down like a clock. They built the shadow clock. They built the water clock. They built the sun dials, etc. It is said when Papademus did his study, and he's a Greek physicist who showed the enormous debt the Greeks owed to the Egyptians. Papademus pointed to the fact that Archimedes, his brother, his 
they claim to be the inventor of the lever, but he must admit it was the black Imhotep who was the master of the lever in the inclined plane long before the Greeks. He pointed to the fact that the Egyptians were century ahead in mining, in metallurgy, in metal alloying, metal fabrication, wires and rivets, glass, complex irrigation sy systems, shipbuilding. And when we come to ships, they had 3,000 years of shipbuilding. Someone was pointing out to me on my way here that they have found a ship, a tremendous boat built by the Egyptians which the priests used, and that after they put this enormous boat up, they would pull it to pieces. It was all fitted in a certain way. They could pull it to pieces and fit it back again. Extraordinary science that existed among these people. They had also started to do things in the camera. They didn't carry it very far. But most important, they started to do things with their planes. I have a picture here of the first model of a glider. We have no knowledge or proof that it was powered, that it had a power source, but it was a glider. And as I have told you before, this glider was found in the museum. It was put there in 1896. It was found at Saqqara, and the Europeans put it in the museum and labeled it a bird. That it is a model of a bird until Khalil Messia, who knows about aeronautics, discovered that birds have legs, and this doesn't. <laughs> and that birds do not have reverse dihedral wings, and that birds have feathers, and this doesn't. And there are several features. Birds have different kinds of tails. And this one had its tail missing, but it had evidence of a rudder attached. Do you know that since that discovery, they have found 14 models of airplanes? And one of them has been found in America. And it doesn't have South American inscriptions. It's not Egyptian either, but one of them has been found in Colombia, a gold airplane gold model of an aeroplane. And these things point to a movement. You see, it wasn't just simply bits and pieces because these people were getting into everything. They were the first people to invent the shower bath. Do you know that the Egyptians had shower baths? The Europeans did not have shower baths until very late in the day. And I know about European bathing because I have lived in Europe. <laughs> English people bathe on Friday night. <laughs> and some of them I remembered once, I think it was Churchill or one of them was boasting how, for how long they had done without a bath. They just hit their face and that's it. The, the, that was one of the extraordinary things that was noted in the Muslim part of Europe, the Arab-African dominated part of Europe, the extraordinary cleanliness of the people. The Africans introduced baths in Europe. You know, these things are so astonishing when you hear things like that. We're the dirty people. We're the illiterates who created the first script. We're the barefoot people who created the first machine to mass produce shoes. Even the clock, we are the, time, we are the people who do not know how to keep time. Do you know the first clock invented in this country was by Benjamin Banneker, a black? One can speak at great length on many things. Next week, I'm going to introduce you to my visit to NASA, the various things I learned or didn't learn there. Today, I will show you some slides, just fleetingly, of me with Dr. Um, Colonel Gregory, who will be the first black pilot of a space shuttle. He wouldn't just be a member of the crew like Colonel Blueford. He would actually pilot the space shuttle. 
and you will also see me with Colonel Bolden who will be going up in 1985. I will also introduce you to many aspects of African American science and other aspects of science throughout the world. I'm about to move now into slides where I could show you some of these things I've been talking about. Before I do that, however, I want you to note what an enormous debt. It wasn't just a question of technologies burgeoning in Egypt, but coalescing in such a way that something very unusual began to happen. It is as if we were at that stage of history where we had become to feel almost something focusing in ourselves that it became a beam and a light. That was a period in which it would be, have been impossible for any invader to have destroyed us. Let me say this. You may not know it. This looks like a dark period, but this is a period in which it is possible for the soul of the European to be subverted because he is filled, in spite of his surface arrogance, he is filled with enormous doubt. The certitudes of the past, the certainties with which he has ruled, no longer have the stability they once had. It is in this period that these values which we learn by going back to our ancestors cannot only make us a new whole people and lift us out of the illness and fragmentation of the past, it can also invade the European, even as the Egyptian did. Bear that in mind. It is through this it is because of this that one goes back into history, because there is lightning in history. There is submerged lightning. There is buried power there. It is as if one is coming back to a source, not just to the source of origins, not just to origins, but to the source of original power, because the human being is a source of power. When you're dead, you're nothing. You're just bones and flesh, etc. You may have a spirit, but it has gone somewhere else. But when you are alive, you contain fantastic energies. You are also millions of years old. You are not 41 or 48 or 16. You are millions of years old. And you are carrying powers that link you up with the whole universe. If those powers are understood, and they can be understood through a relinking, they can be understood through a relinking with the power source of the ancestors because the gene does not die, it runs on. It is something that runs out of those centuries. 10,000 years is nothing in the history of the universe. It took millions of years to make us. 500 years is nothing. We are not destroyed. How can we stand in this room and speak like this in spite of 500 years of slavery and colonization? Yeah. It shows that the spirit of man is imperishable. There is a golden thread that runs through the human soul that cannot be cut. We cannot be, we were cut once, but it's only through our folly that we can remain cut from our ancestors. We have to link that thread again, a thread that not only links us to the past, to our fathers and our forefathers and our grandfathers, but the thread that links us to all of our family throughout the world. When we can do that, a beam of light springs out of our lives, first our individual lives, then our group lives, that will not only affect the black race and redeem it, but will subvert the race that has, in its attempt to destroy us, begun to destroy itself. Thank you very much.
incense burners in Nubia. It's 5,300 years old. And this is the first kingdom in the Nile Valley. And here you see a king. On one side you see a boat, the ritual boat of the kings. You see um, a king sitting down with a crown, a very unusual crown which you find in Egypt. A uh, very uniquely shaped crown. And then you also find just, just beside him, slightly above his head, is a falcon. You have to look very closely to see these symbols because it's being symbolically represented. But all of these features are things that became associated with later kings in the Nile Valley. This is the first kingdom, and it's a black kingdom. Here, 12 black kings reigned uh, even before the Egyptians. So you have even another Nile Valley civilization emerging before the Egyptian civilization. This is the cover of the book which will be coming out um, at the end of this month, Egypt Revisited. Those of you who have bought Egypt history revised, Egyptian history revised should get this because although it repeats most that you find there, there's something that are very new. The cover, for example, is very extraordinary, showing, in a sense, almost the waves of time that seek to pass over to our history, the great sphinx and the pyramids, but cannot, and also the, the strange linkage. It's almost like a spirit flowing there. And there's a special uh, interview with Sheikh Antediyah, uh, interview between Dr. Charles Prince and Sheikh Antedio, um that is in that new issue. It will be like a collector's item. It will have a very beautiful cover, um, a laminated cover with this extraordinary kind of drawing. Um, so look forward to that. That comes in about a month's time. The next slide shows you where they found the very first agricultural settlement in the world. This is um, at Wadi Kubania in Egypt. Here they're excavating various parts of the site. This is, gives you some of the places where these agricultural uh, sites are. You can see Wadi Kubania with the dock there. And you can see below that, Further down in the south, you could see Wadi Tushka, which is in Nubia, just below Abu Simbel. Here is the first mortar and pestle in the world used for grinding grain. This is 18,000 years old. This is the Mbote we are speaking about. Um, as you can clearly see, there is no question about his ancestry. This is the first multi-genius known in the world. He was not only the father of medicine, but a total son of Minis, as I, they say, who was before him. He is considered to be, to have written books on anatomy, but he is the mo most famous. He stands head and shoulders over anyone. He is an architect, an engineer, a doctor, a scribe, everything, you name it, he has done it. He was the man who was to take, now there is the European, <laughs> and there is him with his African stick, an African snake, and standing there as though he made it all. <laughs> he lived in the shadow of Imhotep, who is known as Imhotep, among the Greeks, and he was identified with the black importer. Go ahead. <coughs> there is a page from one of the medical papyri showing you some of the texts that survived um, from the Africans. There are many, many texts that were destroyed um, in the library of Alexander, but this, there are many texts that still survive. The one that is unusual about this is this. If you can see the top closely, you can see where the scribe has corrected an error. 
you could see he, he, he writes in something on the top, correcting something in his manuscript. This is a medical um, book, African medical <coughs> book that goes back about 3,500 years. Okay. Here is, um, I think this is an amputated forearm connected by callus. Um, go ahead. No, no, this is the amputated forearm connected by callus. The previous one was a different kind of bone setting. It's a broken femur, and it was between splints of part, part of wood and fiber, and this is the amputated forearm united by callus. These are various things from Dr. Finch's article showing you the kind of medicine that was practiced in very early times by the Africans. penis surgery. It was circumcision which began among the Africans and eventually was to become a cultural custom that was to affect a great part of the world. And this is brain surgery. This is the famous operation known as trepanation which you find both in the old world and in the new. Square, round circular holes in the skull and square holes. This was used also in battle when, you know, in battle if you got hit, well, of course, today, if they shoot you and you get a hole like that, that's it. But if you were struck by a mace or something like that to relieve the pressure on the brain, they would cut a hole in the skull. Strangely enough, most people survive this. A new, a new plaque of bone would grow over the scalp, over the area, only about 15% of the operations were unsuccessful and then a large cavity would be there, you would see. Yeah. This you find both in Egypt as well in, as in Peru. You would find many skulls with this kind of surgical operation. This is the one we missed. This is circumcision being practiced by the doctors in ancient Egypt. There you also have a chance to look at the faces to see whether they're caucasoid. Oh, yeah. Here are a number of instruments. They're in the middle there. There's a metal irrigation, irrigator with spout. Um, there's a very instrument. There is a tweezers there, and there is a hook. See near that spoon, there's a hook. That's used to evacuate your brain when you die. This is Ames Papyrus. We're moving now into pyramid mathematics, um, where they saw, they said the Egyptians were not practical, or, or they were too practical, and they did not get involved in um, mathematics, that just theoretical mathematics and physics, which is not true. Anyway, this is a problem solved in pyramid mathematics by the Egyptians. And it's in two of their scripts. Here is the thing I was telling you about moving an incredibly huge statue. And it's showing you the different men involved, those at the bottom moving and some object which has to be connected at a certain point. And then there's a man there. He's pouring this mysterious oil down, which makes it easy to move the object. Here is um, putting some tremendous thing in parts on a barge and, and bring, taking it down the Nile. Granite columns for the pyramid complex in Venice at Saqqara, the fifth dynasty. This is 2,400 years before Christ. Here is an attempt. This is now in Europe where they stole one of the pyramids and are trying to put it back up. <laughs> and 
this is down, this is many centuries later, of course, and then they're finding it, an eno what an enormous job it, it, it presents. And then this is a scaling ladder, and if you could see the bottom, you would see wheels, or the metal wheels at the bottom. There's a spike there that you plug into the building where you're building. Workmen are going up there to do what they have to do. Now this is the, um, the peculiar way in which you would have some sort of aperture or window or shaft built into the pyramids so as to let the light from a star or sun in. There you would see how it is we how the, the Africans got the sun or the stars to reflect its light along all these corridors by throwing the light against metal reflectors that would carry it right through underground chambers and tunnels. There you see, um, since they think Egypt is Arab, they have an Arab <laughs> examining his handiwork. Decided to us when you were at NASA how difficult it is for blacks, even when they are brilliant, to be uh, have the e equal opportunities with whites. There was an incident where uh, there was a shipwreck, and uh, th this was used to illustrate that blacks have to be, for a black to, to, to be a pilot of a space shuttle, he has to have twice as much genius as a white who becomes a pilot. And there was an incident where there was a shipwreck and there were four people surviving, three whites and one black. The white captain turned to the crew and said, now this, there's only enough rations to last us, only enough rations for three men, okay? And I'm going to be very fair, I'm going to ask you three questions and who can't answer goes overboard. So he turns to the first white man and he says, when did the Titanic sink? And the man says, 1915. Then he turns to the second white man and he says, how many people were drowned? And the white man hesitates for a while and he says, 1,500. Then he turns to the black and he says, name them. <laughs> faces, especially when it has to do with science. So look at the, um, the method that is used, which they have now um, indicated for. There you see pictures, and you can clearly see those faces. There you see pictures drawn by the Egyptians without so-called light. And they're lighted pictures. I mean, you could see the light source in itself actually introduces into the picture the, the, the sensation of light, the spirit of light. Go ahead. This is the Marquette that I was talking to you about. Note the faces, tan skins, where they can't draw Africans because it's science. This is in the heart of, of Egypt in ancient times. <laughs> this is the model temple where Heron in, in, in Alexandria built a temple that was related to the fire. And when the fire was lit, you would find the temple doors would open. And when the fire went down, the temple doors would close. And this was regulated by the priests. Um, so that you would know when um, this was regulated by the priest and related to his sermons, etc. It seemed almost like magic to the congregation. 
This is a pneumatic organ also built by Hero. And this work works with pullers and levies and all sorts of things. And you sit there, of course, and you play your music. And there are all sorts of complicated machinery at the bottom that enables this the um, peculiar vacuum and movement of sound, etc. This is the famous jet propulsion, the first evidence of jet propulsion for a steam engine devised by Hero working with jet propulsion. And this is the obelisk. This shows you a way in which the shadow from the sun would make, as the, as the sun moves, it makes a longer shadow or a shorter shadow. When it is exactly without shadow, you know it's noon. And you would be able to cut those pieces. They would have things that enable you to cut those pieces so that you could tell the time. It's a very elaborate way of telling the time. But this is a public clock. You can't build an obelisk in your backyard. <coughs> this is the famous ship. Talking about navigation. This is the famous ship built by Africans in 1969. Uh, under the African... Abdullah de Jibrin of the Baduma people, Tor Haidal bought the papyrus reed, etc., from Ethiopia. This was built using tomb and temple paintings in ancient Egypt and it was able to cross from Safi in North Africa all the way to Barbados in the Caribbean. Although the rudders broke on the first day so that it did not steer, it steered itself. The African currents took it from Africa to America by itself. And these are the currents that show you how this is done. That off the Cape Verde, there's a current that takes you right into the Caribbean towards Florida. There's one off the Senegambia coast going down past the Cape Verde. This is the one Columbus used on his third voyage when he goes along Africa and goes along the Senegambia coast and is taken to Trinidad. Just um, a day short of South America, and then it takes you also into the Caribbean, and then there's one from Southern Africa that takes you to South America. It was on this current that Columbus sailed on the third voyage after learning that Africans had gotten to the Caribbean before him. He was testing this current. He found that it cut the European journey by half, but the Europeans could not use it because in those burning latitudes, they nearly died. If rain did not fall, Columbus said they would have perished. Because it was extremely hot, so hot in fact, that they roasted meat putrefied, and the cask, the cask of wine, burst. So that they couldn't use the route the Africans used as easily. This is the first model of the airplane, as I say, which was um, thought to be a bird until Kali Messia discovered, as I say, that it had no feet, no feathers, and it reversed eye. Hebrew wings did not link to birds. It's just that drawing of the eye that indicated this. You see some holes at the back there, that's where the tail fell off in the model, and you have evidence from the way they examined those holes microscopically that the rudder was attached. This is this was just the model, but NASA uh, informed me that when they rebuilt the plane to specifications, it could fly. And that it had solved aerodynamic problems that had taken nearly a century for European and American engineers to solve. And that it was no toy, that it was built to scale. And after that discovery, they have now found 14 of them. Nobody has written on this, no research has been done on this. They just have the models, and this is something open for research by someone who knows something about aerodynamics. Because there is no question that these people were going pretty far, and they were on the edge of something else. Now that is something from Sumer. They say Baghdad, but Baghdad was in what was then Sumerian ter territory. I can't comment on this, and it doesn't mean with Egyptian, but I thought I would let you see it because this is the first battery in the world and it's thousands of years old. Here is asphaltum and copper and clay and iron, etc. 
and it cannot be explained. We do not know how the Sumer, it's found in Sumerian territory in the Sumerian period. We do not know why they used it or how they used it or how they invented it, but it's an equivalent to our modern battery. This is something that I will talk about in later, in later years in my sequel to They Came Before Columbus. This is an astonishing picture which I only found, which was only sent to me. It was found by a young black Wayne Chandler, who after reading They Came Before Columbus started doing investigations of his own and discovered that a black king, this is right where the stone heads are, this is a black king at the Venta, right on at the bottom of the first pyramid in America. Now some of you may have doubts as to whether that is European or Asiatic. <laughs> right? Do you know what happened to this figure? It has never been published before. Perhaps this is the first time in America to show it to a public audience. I'm not in fact allowed to show it until 1984. But I thought I could share it with you. But this was smuggled into Germany and then found after many years search by a man called Robert Heiser who wrote an article on the movement of stones, showing the identical movement of stones in Egypt and in America. But it was kept quietly in his study. He never showed it to anyone. Okay. This is the crown of this black nobleman or king found at Leventa, in the Leventa pyramid, 800 years before Christ. Huh? Now look at that. This is the same place, just a few feet away, at Leventa, 800 years before Christ. This is one of the stone heads you've seen with African features. And look at the hair. And this picture has never been shown. This picture is 50 years old and has never been shown in the world. It was sitting in a desk in the library of the widow of Dr. Matthew Sterling, who first went out in 1938 and discovered, rediscovered one of the stone heads. This is a stone head in the vendor, not only with African features, but with hair that is clearly not African. Not, not Native American Asiatics. This is me at NASA with Colonel Bolden, who will be going up into space in 1985. Here am I introducing him to blacks in science. <laughs> Colonel Gregory, there's a slight touch on the negative. This is Colonel Gregory, the first pilot of a space shuttle. I think he will take a space shuttle up next year. He will be the pilot. He is the technical monitor of astronauts. He's also responsible for many inventions. He is the first man to invent, to, to sell, and to help to develop the micro instrumentation landing system which enables the, a computer from the ground to lock onto the plane and bring it down on a pin whether the pilots are dead or drunk. <laughs> He's also the leading technical monitor of the astronaut. No astronaut in the American space team has as much technical knowledge as he. He is the one who may have answered the question, name them. Yeah. <laughs> he is the man who created the, uh, the atomic power controller which cuts fatigue in the pilot's cabin by half. And it is, it is something also that is going to change. He is the man who changed the cockpit of the, of the future. He is the man also that was responsible for redesigning the cockpit, the brain of the space shuttle, the most advanced machine of our age. He was the man who re redesigned the cockpit for the last four shuttles. Mm -hmm. Colonel Gregory, give him a hand. <laughs> I think that we shall end now. It's this. Um, has 
been an opportunity to introduce you just a, a few aspects of Egyptian science. It's not comprehensive, but it gives you an opportunity to see once again, as I have said, where... Sister Keffel just pointed out, on sale blacks in science, almost everything I've spoken of today is covered by the book Blacks in Science. Let me say before you start questions, the, the title of my lecture today is Egyptian Science. Try and restrict your questions to Egyptian Science. There's a vast number of things in that field which, which we have to cover, and there's things that need clarification, expansion. If it is possible to expand, clarify, there are also certain connections to that which can be explored. So don't waste time of the audience by talking about things that have nothing to do with Egyptian science. Okay. Go ahead. Excuse me? Seventeenth century. Yes, because the European mathematicians advanced tremendously after they broke the hold of the church over science. You, you must remember, you see, that um, the African for the last five centuries has not been able, he, he has made tremendous um, unknown advances, not as a whole people. You see, for example, for every African scientist, for every African American scientist, there are at least 1,000 or 10,000 white scientists. Only a few of us are allowed into science. Okay, so you, you, you have to understand it's not a question of genius, it's a question of opportunity. When we were enslaved or made colonials, even today, there are only a few people, you see that one man, Blueford, sent up in space, why they took all those years to send him up in space? There were those, those men have been standing around for a long time, they, they sent up about uh, 50 white astronauts before they send up one black. We could therefore assume that, you know, that only whites are involved in space science, when as I shall show next week, that there are many aspects of space science that blacks have contributed to. But it is true that because we were not allowed to write books, it's only within the last 50 years that blacks start writing books because blacks were, if you were even forbidden to read in my country, a, a, an Englishman was executed for teaching blacks to read. He was executed. So there is no mystery about Europeans being given credit for physics and maths because they not only did the physics and maths when we were doing nothing because we weren't even allowed to enter those fields. It's only quite recently we are allowed to enter those fields. And then when you go back into the early period where there were major contributions like the standards of measurement which are largely African. The hour, the second of time, the second of arc, all those are African. But a European begins his history with the Greeks because he's not going to begin it with black people who he has under his foot. He's not going to be stupid enough to say, yes, we all owed it to the blacks and then the blacks get bumptious and start to overthrow the system. I mean, it wouldn't make sense. He had to suppress the truth because the truth would make us free, but the truth would kill him. <laughs>
advanced civilizations of the African. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Taking that into account, taking into account that the dog of people, uh, you know, had knowledge of the walk star. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, this is a book called Cyrus. Yes. Yeah. Serious. Yeah. You know, just saw it could be seen, you know, by the human eye. And also taking into account that the Egyptians did have some knowledge of um, aviation. Uh, would it be far-fetched to conclude that uh, baby Egyptians might very well have some knowledge of space travel as well? Um, no, let me correct one or two things because, uh, first of all, there was we have no evidence of very advanced civilizations in the Sahara. We have evidence of cultures in the Sahara. The, the Egyptian thing, the African and along the Nile Valley became highly advanced, highly complex. Um, so advanced, so complex, that is the reason why we go back and back to him. But in the Sahara, even though there were cultures going back 200,000 years, we have no evidence in the Sahara of a great science. It may have existed, but at, at so far we haven't found it. We've only recently, a few months ago, through the radar sent down from space, we were able to see beneath the Sahara and we see evidence of rivers running from the Sahara towards the Egyptian, Ethiopian world. And we have evidence that there were cultures there 200,000 years ago. 200,000 years ago, okay. Those cultures therefore could have advanced until, as you suggest, there may have been a major civilization in the Sahara, but we haven't found it yet. So we can only speak of cultures, whereas we know with an absolute certainty that in Nubia and in Egypt along that Nile Valley, you don't just have cultures, but you have highly complex and advanced civilization. With respect to the Dogon, it is true that you could see Sirius with the naked eye, but they didn't see Sirius, they saw Sirius B, which cannot be seen with the naked eye. And that indicates that they had advanced astronomy because they were able not only to see it, they were able to plot its orbit and trajectory up to the end of the 20th century. Seven centuries ago, the Africans had plotted its orbit up to 1990. They were also able to show its nature, which was very extraordinary. They were able to show that it was a compacted mass and that it was a white dwarf, where they didn't use those terms, but they showed it was like a seed in the sky, that it was a compacted mass and that although there were stars around it that were uh, larger, yet it was heavier and that if all the people in the world, they said, was one lifting mechanism, they couldn't even budge it. So there were things that astonish us in that African astronomy. There was something else you mentioned. After you mentioned the Dogon and the Sahara, you mentioned something else. Oh yes, that because of the navigation. Well, the, the aeronautics thing was experimental. It may have been more than experimental because they, f- they have found an aircraft, the model of an aircraft in South America, and it's not South American. It has Middle East markings. Okay, which would seem to suggest that we can't go that far yet because we haven't found enough which seems to suggest that it is possible that someone coming from the Mediterranean could have flown over into South America if their technology had advanced that far. But at the moment, they are now looking. Nobody has yet examined the 14 models of the airplanes. They photographed it. They know their airplanes. They know their models. But we haven't found an actual airplane. We have only found the models of the airplane. The actual things may be under the ground. So that a lot of work remains to be done before we could go as far as you're suggesting that these guys had actually started to do other things as well. We only have one evidence of that. We have at Nazca in Peru, we have markings on the rocks which suggest that people must have been navigating in the air to make those markings because it makes no sense in the ground. It only makes sense if you're in an aircraft. And we have also found an extraordinary thing in the Library of Alexandria, a fragment 
a map which shows that people must have been moving in the air because they saw things at the poles which you can only see with an aircraft. But we can't explain those things yet. They seem to move in that direction, but we can't explain them. We have no evidence beyond aircraft. Yes. Uh, what? How long did the uh, Egyptian wire stay in flight? Okay, there is, let, let me suggest the source. There is a book which is very racist, by the way. Um, it's called The Lost Races. And it's by Rene Nurbergen. Nurbergen. Uh, I don't advise you to read all of it. It is one of the most racist books I have ever read. But it has an interesting section that develops this business about the airplane. Of course, he thinks the Egyptians are white, so he thinks it, it has nothing to do with blacks. But it should be read for what is known about the airplane, that they solved problems with the airplane that we took a long time to solve, which means they must have carried it beyond what we think was ex purely experimental. And he suggests that they seem to have found evidence, and I don't know what evidence, he doesn't present it, that it w did have a power source. It did have a small power source, and it was used for lifting weights, and it only moved at 60 miles an hour, but it kept up in the air, and it was lifting heavy objects. Okay. is just a word. It could be ten, it could be a million. All I'm trying to impress upon you is the lack of opportunities that were given to us. Okay. Yes, okay. I don't know how to start. This is something that has deeply frustrated me. About a few years ago, I met an African geophysicist. I thought that that would give, give me a key because this is something I really want to do. Um, I can't remember his name. Uh, he told me that he'd taken, he was, he was testing for water and he'd taken a very expensive and delicate American machine t to Nigeria. And it had to, there, there were some slight on the ground explosions that he would, he would um, bring about in order to test for water. And the machine broke down and he couldn't get money to send it to America to get it prepared or get a new machine. And then he, he remembered that in the village where he grew up, the Africans had been using gunpowder, using um, palm kernel. 
and that the Africans in fact did have a gunpowder before Europe and that they developed it with, with, out of this corner. He went to these people and they gave him the gunpowder and he was able to continue with his sounding for water using African gunpowder. So I said to him, please, this is very extraordinary. Have you written it down anywhere? He said yes, in the jump journal in Nigerian science or something like that. And I said, well, would you write it for the Journal of African Civilization? He said, yes, I would. So I called him back two months later and he said, look, I can't get the pictures from Nigeria. He said, forget the pictures, just write down the research. Just let me have an outline of what was done, what was discovered, etc., where the village and so forth. And he appeared and the third month he came to my door and I was asleep and he put an article into my box. And when I went downstairs, he called me up and he says, I'll give you an article. I said, it is, was it on the, the African gunpowder? He says, it's equally good. So I went and I opened the box and there was an article on um, the technique of building mud houses. Wouldn't then to be on that. He'd been trained by the British that, you know, don't make any big claims about anything or get involved in what had been done in early science, technique of building mud houses. I found that when I led a team with Willa Johnson, we went, we led a team to Barry Fell's, um, into Barry Fell's uh, laboratory, the Agassiz Museum, when he was in, he was at Harvard. Uh, we let, we, there were 16 African anthropologists, 10 or 16, I can't remember. Archaeologists, you know, not anthropologists. These were 10 African archaeologists, top flight archaeologists. We found that the Nigerian archaeologists would not dig deeper than European dominated territory. They were only interested in that part of history that had Europeans in it. Anything deeper, they wouldn't go down. The Ethiopian would. Only the Ethiopians who had a long civilization that in spite of all the tragedies still had a certain cultural intactness, they were willing to go deeper. They had found things earlier than Leaky. And uh, they um, were willing to publish this in the journal. There again I tried and found only the Ethiopians were interested in what we are interested in. Okay? Um, and then there was a very extraordinary man, he's from Egypt, an Egyptian, a black Egyptian, who was master of many ancient as well as modern Egyptian dialects. And he walked into the studio, this is very extraordinary, and he saw on the wall a plaque from Peru, which Barifel had said, Barifel didn't tell him how old it was, and Barifel didn't tell him where he got it from. But he, he, he and I knew, Fell and I knew, because we were involved in pre-Columbian America, with Egyptian dress, etc. people standing in Peru with Egyptian dress, a royal thing. And this guy went to the thing and read it out in, in an ancient Egyptian dialect, which is unknown. And he says, obviously, this is from Egypt. And Fell said, no, this is from Peru. He said, that is impossible. And we spent hours until he shook his head. He says, I know nothing about this. This is a whole new world to me. But at least we could draw him in because he had done that speed work. If anyone could find African scientists, if they could be brought together, not necessarily as a group, but if they could be sent to produce papers, or if one could even have access to their, to their journals, their scientific journals, this would make an enormous difference. Okay, thank you.
and the mathematics is still in terms. And he had told me that there was no evidence to prove that they had any uh, knowledge of geometry, trigonometry, or anything such like that. So he told me that I could get some information, and he would gladly, you know, welcome into the class. So I, I was wondering. In blacks and science, ancient and modern. St. Vincent writings, but if you find writings, you should photograph them. You should do more than photograph. You should go down, you should go on the rock and feel them with your fingers and put chalk in them and photograph them. This is what I did in the um, um, in the Virgin Islands at St. John and St. Thomas. That's what you're talking about. In St. John's I photographed the right. I couldn't decipher them because I didn't know anything about that script. I didn't even know it was a script. It was deciphered though at Harvard Department of Antiquities. But you would have to photograph them before you can make any inquiries to where they come from or whether they're Carib or not. Okay, this is yeah. Um, it's also known that um, black men. Um, Well, I, I don't deal with the slave period, okay? I only this deal with... Actually, yes, but, but I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm not... I'm interested because one is interested in the total black condition, but I have learned that as it is now, even though one is specializing in certain areas, the Egyptian... American connection, the Egyptian European connection, the Egyptian Asian connection, how Africa links up in the world. That in dealing with ancient times before the coming of the European, which is what interests me, because after Europe, I am so sad that I don't even want to think about it. Yes. Okay. But the point is that there are there are people who are very trained in dealing with post-European black history and, and that is not my interest. I, be, I will read what they write because they will teach me about that. I am here to teach people about what we were before the coming of the slaver. Okay, no, I'm just telling, I'm just declaring my focus because no one can completely encompass black history. And if you try to do it, you may not be able to make discoveries because you have to enter a field and you have to cut off your field. And as you probe deep and deep in that field, your mind becomes like a beam and like the radar, you go under the ground and find things. 
Okay, the moment you start to jump like this, to embrace everything, you know, then you find nothing. You just accumulate knowledge like a computer. I'm not interested in masses of knowledge. I'm interested in knowledge that penetrates. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I can explain that to you. There, these things are explained, however, in the invention by Hiron, how the fire would create a certain kind of heat that would go up the pipes and move a lever that would pull the doors. And then the fire is out, the, the heat, the, the air would be cooled, the lever would go back, and the doors would, sh would shut. That is how it is done. speaker Fred Rees. He has done some very tremendous work in mathematics and computers. In fact, he's trying to make blacks sensitive to the com to computer technology. It's very important to those of you who are interested, in fact, who would like your children to be trained into the computer age before it becomes too late, should contact him and find out what he's doing because I have, in fact, been tremendously impressed by the work he has been doing in this field. Now I be I found that in a book somewhere. And I thought I had it. It is one of the slides that I hope to bring with me today. I have not found it again. It was an extremely expensive illustrated book where they had a picture of a man, an Egyptian in a house, leading a wire, what looked like a wire with some kind of a hook, and plugging it into some. He didn't plug it into the wall because there was no, it was an isolated incident. He had created something, or someone had created something, that enabled him to plug into something that had power, that would light something. And they speak of the, spoke, the smokeless moon. But um, I've been unable to follow it up because I thought I had the book with me. I assumed for the past year it was sitting in my desk, but it was sitting in my head. Okay, I have to find it again, but, the, but this is something that I'm very interested in following up. There is some evidence to suggest that they were aware of electricity. Yes. Yeah. Just ask a question, yeah. I believe 
researching now. The pain person met the was Richard B. Moir, a police. Could you come closer to the yeah. mic? Yeah. 